Dear friends and colleagues, it's a great pleasure to welcome and introduce a Carleton University graduate, Dr. An Sang Su Chi, who received an honorary degree from Carleton University, making her a Carleton graduate, and who, like one of our former chancellors, is the holder of a Nobel laureate. It's appropriate that we welcome her to Carleton University, where the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, the Department of Political Science, the Department of Law and Human Rights, the School of Journalism lead in areas of concern and merit the caliber of speaker that we have today. It's appropriate that Carleton University hosts this event because Carleton University has a global consciousness and outreach. We know that the problems that we have are problems of the world and the problems of the world are problems we share. Earl Burney, the Canadian poet, said no man, and he probably meant woman either, is an I land, and Canada is not an insular country. Carleton University is a high-tech university, always at the cutting edge, focusing on real world issues. So we're glad that our technology gets to show off and, and we get to welcome Aung San Suu Kyi today. On a personal note, I visited Burma many years ago just before you were placed in house arrest. And I was so moved by the situation that I dedicated a book I wrote called Birmani Blues to you. And I was really warmed by the fact that I understood you were learning French um, to keep your mind busy. And uh, so I sent you several volumes. And I understand that you didn't get them. And I sent them later to your husband, who wrote me a lovely letter thanking me and assuring me that you probably would never see them. So my privilege of seeing you today is doubly sweet. It's my, now my pleasure to welcome our moderator for the day, Evan Solomon, anchor of CBC News Networks, um, Power and Politics, CBC Radio One's show, The House. He's had a career of many important programs. Um, he has covered world events of great uh, import. He has interviewed international figures. So it is very appropriate that he come today to welcome our guest and to moderate our session. Thank you very much, Doctor, for coming. Thank you, Evan, for moderating the event. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great honor to be here. Dr. Suchi, it's a great honor to have you here for the first time doing something like this in Canada with Canadian students and with journalists. It's a great pleasure and it's long overdue. I, I do just quickly also want to thank Tin Mong Chu, the Executive Director of the Canadian Friends of Burma as well for organizing this, uh, which is extraordinary work they've been doing in spearheading this event. And um, I want to thank Carlton, of course, for doing this as well. Let's start uh, Aung San Suu Kyi or Da Suu Kyi, as you're called by, by many, many people. Again, a great pleasure to be here. Before I start with some questions, can you give us some opening remarks, perhaps, about uh, the current state of the situation in Burma? As people know, um, by-elections coming, and your current, uh, the news about your ability to campaign. Could you give us some opening remarks, uh, perhaps? Thank you. At the moment, everybody is very interested in what is going on in Burma. Some are a little bit too optimistic about the situation. We are cautiously optimistic. We are at the beginning of a road. Whether we shall be able to get onto it is another matter altogether. We are trying to get onto the road to genuine democratization. And uh, the coming by-elections will give us some indication as to how far we shall be able to travel. At the moment, we have some problems with regard to our election campaign. Everything is not as you might expect it to be in a truly democratic society. But then, of course, we all know that we are not yet a truly democratic society. But on the other hand, compared to what it was like a year ago, two years ago, it is very, very different. I am able to travel freely around the country, and even if sometimes uh, 
we meet with a few obstacles with regard to, to our election campaign. I'm able to meet the public. We are able to communicate with one another. And that is the most important thing for any political party. We have been able to reconnect with our people. And that is the great difference for us. Tell us a bit about um, this nominal civilian government there, backed by the military, different than the military junta government. Um, what kind of controls are they exerting? And if you can, just to give us some details about the importance of this by-election. I understand there's 48 seats, and even if your party won all of the seats, it wouldn't change, the, the military would st still be in control. So can you give us a perspective of, of how they're controlling the nominal civilian government and then perhaps the significance of this by-election? I think we just have to look at the constitution uh, that was adopted in 2008 to find out how much control uh, the army has over the government. In accordance with that constitution, the commander in chief is it can take over all powers of government at any time that he, he deems fit. He does not have to refer to the National Assembly at all. So in a sense, you can say that ultimate power still rests with the army. So until we have the army solidly behind the process of democratization, we cannot say that we, we have got to a point where there will be no danger of a U-turn. Many people are beginning to say that the democratization process here is irreversible. This is not the point, this is, it's not so. This is why I said we're cautiously optimistic. We don't know exactly how the army stands with regard to the reforms that have been instituted by the president and some of his former ministers. We, we, the public, are still quite distanced from the army. So there are many, many obstacles that have, been, have to be overcome before we can say, yes, we are truly on the path to democracy. Are we under military rule? No, we are not under military rule. We are under civilian rule. But this civilian rule, as uh, instituted by the Constitution, is very much under the dominance of the military. Can you give us a sense of what perhaps is driving the civilian, nominal civilian government, uh, possibly the military, to uh, open up to democratic reform? What are the things that are affecting uh, this government's decision? Uh, and, and your thoughts as I move to questions of what the international community can do. But what do you think the motives are? I think, firstly, the president is genuinely interested in reform. And I think uh, the government has become very much aware of the dissatisfaction of the great majority of our people. There is a lot of poverty in this country. This is a country which is rich in natural resources, but the people are very poor. And the sad state of the economy has really come home to many people in power including those who were very recently in the army. You mustn't forget that the, this present civilian government is made up almost entirely of ex-members of the military. But uh, they began to realize that there was a need for change. Whether the army is behind this move, I cannot tell. As I said earlier, we are still quite some distance away from the army. We have very little, we civilians have very little contact with the military. Dr. Suchi, tell, tell us about the international community's role here. Uh, let's start with Canada. Uh, Canada's policy has been one of condemnation and a kind of moral position on this government, uh, but not necessarily one of constructive engagement. Uh, for example, supporting specific programs. What can Canada do if it should do more in terms of engagement with the government in Burma? Let me say that we are very grateful for what Canada has already done. Canada is the one country that had overall sanctions against Burma. And uh, to those who ask whether or not sanctions uh, have been effective, I would answer yes, very, very confidently, because this government is always asking for sanctions to be removed. And one of the, 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 the very first motion that was tabled successfully 
in this new assembly was one asking for the dismantling of sanctions. So if sanctions had been effective, if sanctions had not been effective, uh, this would not such be a, a, an important issue for them. So Canada has helped us greatly with regard uh, to our movement of democracy. And the, the way you can, in which you can continue to help us is to keep up your awareness of what is happening in Burma. Don't be too optimistic, don't be too pessimistic. Try to see things as they are and try to keep contact with the ordinary people of Burma. That is how you will learn whether or not we are making any progress under this new government. Are there other, uh, perhaps, moves, uh, policies that the government could adopt outside of the efficacy of sanctions? Well, I'll answer those questions after the elections, because a lot depends on how the elections go and how free and fair the run up to the elections are and how things go after the elections. Don't forget that in 1990, we had elections which were considered free and fair by the whole world. And after that, uh, nothing happened. That is to say, although my party won over 80% of the seats in the National Assembly, Parliament was never convened, and uh, we just ended up by having to face a lot of oppression. Many of our members, including our elected MPs, were thrown into prison or hounded out of the country. So we must wait until after the elections to find out whether or not there have been real changes. And depending on these changes, there should be uh, suitable changes in policy. I wonder on a wider scale, you've become a global symbol of peaceful resistance. Here we are witnessing events in Syria um, where the people are rising up and it's a very bloody resistance. Uh, you've seen and, and talked about, and I, and I know watched closely the Arab Spring, uh, in some countries it's, it's functioned differently. How do you reconcile resistance, for example, what's happening in Syria with what's happening in your country of Burma? Each country is different, and the circumstances in each country are different. In 1988, we had a, a national uprising for democracy, and although the people were not violent, we were put down in a very, very violent way by the military government. So. Each country is different. The people of Burma did not react in the way in which the people of Syria did, which is not to say that uh, I think that we were wrong or that the Syrians were right or that we were right and they were wrong. I think each country copes with the situation it has to face in its own way. But I think that uh, a peaceful resistance, a peaceful revolution is best all around because although it might have to, it might take us longer to get to our goal, the, the wounds are not so great. And I believe that when change comes about through violence and through bloodshed, there are deep, deep wounds which take a long time to heal. And that, and these wounds become tremendous obstacles in the way of genuine democratization. Tell me uh, about the role of the international community. We're watching it around the world, as you say, the different situations. Uh, you met with Hillary Clinton. Yes. What role do, do international countries like the United States and China, what role are they playing right now at possibly different ends of the political spectrum in terms of reforms going on inside Burma? I do not think that China or the United States in particular have any direct influence on the reforms that are going on in Burma. The United States, through sanctions, have, as I said earlier, sanctions have been effective. Sanctions have played a part in making the government here understand that there is a need for change. But it, uh, it is not that uh, any country anywhere is dictating what kind of changes should take place in this country. Basically. It is the will of the people of Burma which is beginning to make itself felt. And we have been able to do this because of the help that we have received from our friends abroad. I ask you partly because there's a great debate that's going on, and I, and I, th I think your perspective would be instructive, on responsibility to protect. When certain regimes have cracked down on on civilian populations, and the world debates what to do, whether there are sanctions, uh, whether there is a situation like in Libya where there's a, the military ought to come in. 
how, what's your view on how we understand the world's responsibility to protect when citizens are losing their rights or are perhaps uh, in harm's way? Well, there are such things as basic human rights. And I think if people really want to know about it, they do know about it. Those who, who pretend not to know about human rights just don't want to know. And so this, is what, this goes back to what I said earlier. Awareness is so important. You have to be aware of what is going on in a country if, if you want to help it, if you want to know when we should try to help. I do think that everybody all over the world has a responsibility to try to promote human rights anywhere in the, on this globe. The My name is Richard Weeks. I'm a co-founder of Canadian Friends of Burma. I've just returned from a four-week visit to Burma. And I was struck by the sense of hope and new opportunity that one feels there. And uh, also encouraged by the uh, number of new ceasefire agreements that have been signed, particularly with the Karen. I also had an opportunity to spend some days in Kachin State, where I observed the distressing consequences of a breakdown in a ceasefire agreement that was in place for 17 years until June last year. And um, I think one of the things one observes is that the real underlying issues um, were not dealt with beyond the ceasefire. So I, I wanted to ask you what your hopes, plans, vision is for addressing this whole is underlying issue of the uh, ethnic minorities, perhaps in a way that could give some hope as, um, as that meeting which with your father in 1947 when, when the ethnic minorities agreed um, on what terms they would enter the union. And maybe just a final thing is, you know, how can, can Canada as a, as a federal country um, help in any way to remove the sense of fear there is of other systems which could be viewed as a threat to unity? Well, you're quite right about saying that, this, that ceasefires do not necessarily lead to a peaceful settlement. Uh, the ceasefires are only the very first step. And although they have achieved ceasefires in some parts of the country, as you pointed out, hostilities are still going on in the Kitchen State. If we want to bring peace to this country, we'll have to do it through ne negotiation and political settlement based on the Panglong spirit. This is what all the ethnic nationality nationalities want and we have to start uh, we have to stop being frightened of the term federal this has been misunderstood and misinterpret misinterpreted deliberately uh, through through military government propaganda for many decades there are people in Burma who think that federal means right to secession. Of course, we know that this is not so, but a lot of people do not know in Burma because of this uh, propaganda. So we have to respect the aspirations of the ethnic nationalities and try to build up a genuine union based on the Panglong Agreement. And if we think of federal, we should not think in terms of secession, which is not what our ethnic nationalities want. They simply want autonomy and self-determination as laid down by a constitution that will be acceptable to all our ethnic nationalities. And this is what we'll have to work towards. Hello, uh, my name is Mahmoud Naki. I'm a master's student at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Um, there have been rumors that you are may possibly get a cabinet seat depending on the uh, outcomes of the by-elections. Uh, is this something that the NLD would be prepared to accept if it is offered? Well, since the offer has not been made, I think it would be premature and rather presumptuous to make an answer to that. But I can tell you one thing, that under the President Constitution, if you become a member of the government, you have to vacate your seat in the National Assembly. And I'm not working so hard to get into Parliament simply to vacate my seat. Hi, my name is Jasmine. I'm a recent graduate of University of Toronto. Um, you're my hero. My mom's side is from Burma, and there's a lot of people here who are just ordinary people. And what advice, I guess, or what, what do you think we can do to help your situation there, just as ordinary people going about our day-to-day -day life? Well, to help ordinary people in day-to-day -day life, I think you'll have to 
try ways and means of connecting up with the NGOs and other institutions which are working in Burma. I would very much like help with, in, particularly in the areas of education and health. Now, there are many things that you could do. For example, I, I would very much like to send um, our students from Burma to your university on scholarships. Uh, we would like to expand our educational and scholarship programs. And we would like to, to try to help uh, in the realm of health. There are many things that ordinary people can do simply by, 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 uh, by uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the right word. Uh, well, if you could send us medicines, for example, uh, by just donating some money to the right institutions. But the first thing you must do is to get in touch with organizations already working in Burma to find out what they are doing and whether you would be interested in promoting the activities. Because you're, you're, you have family connection there, can you just give us any, your first, when you first heard about Aung San Suu Kyi, any of the, just from your past, how you grew up with her role in, in your life? Just very quickly. Um, I didn't really know too much about it. My grandparents speak Burmese. They came here 40, 50 years ago. Um, there was a Burmese language school being offered here when I was a student in high school. So I attended, and, and from there, a lot of recent immigrants trying to learn English. I was helping out and connection to the Canadian Friends of Burma from there. And ever since then, uh, I've been trying to do what I can. I host a talk show, and we'll put you on. <laughs> uh, hello. My name is Ji Young, and I came to Korea uh, last year from South Korea. And I had many Burmese political refugee friends working for the democracy in Burma and Korea in, uh, at the same time in Korea. And uh, after I got to know about today's talk, yesterday I was talking to my uh, Burmese political activists who are working in Korea now for more than 20 years after that 1988 democratic movement. And they were, as, as you say, they were also very much optimistic and at the same time very much pessimistic uh, about that incoming uh, this election. And, but at the same time, since they've been away from Burma for more than 20 years as a political activist, they really wanted to, uh, I, I, I was feeling that they really wanted to go back to Burma. So my question would be, well, how do you see the role of political refugee or political activists who are not in, inside Burma now, but in outside, and about this uh, incoming election? Well, how do you see their role, or, and also at the same time, the activists who are working with them? Well, with regard to the coming by elections, there isn't that much time left. So if the activists abroad would like to be involved, which uh, they can be through the internet and other ways, just by observing the situation and by seeing whether the process towards the elections is free and fair. But if you're talking about the long term after the elections, I think they'll have to wait to find out for themselves whether the situation is such that they could return to Burma and uh, and work as you would wish to hear. I don't think a polit uh, some political activists want to be political activists forever. I think they're just they just want to uh, work as uh, as uh, it, for democracy until democracy is achieved. And once democracy has been achieved, there, there are many who I'm sure will want to come back to our country to contribute in different ways. Uh, thank you, Evan, and uh, thank you for joining us today, Ms. Suchi. Um, my name is Sid Rashid. I'm a member of, uh, actually an intern with the Nobel Women's Initiative, um, for whom you're an honorary laureate and for whom um, we strongly support. Uh, we strongly support your struggle. Uh, I'm wondering if you can touch on a couple things. Um, maybe one, if you can give your thoughts, uh, maybe on the, on the new the new president, carefully of course, um, whether it seems as though they, he may be open um, to more liberal changes. Um, and two, with the, the upcoming election, I'm wondering if maybe you can touch on um, some short-term goals uh, your movement has. Thank you. Well, with regard to the president, I do believe that he's sincere about wanting reform and uh, that he will try his best. But as I said earlier, a lot depends on what the position of the army is. With regard to the goal of the NLD after the by-elections, first of all, of course, the reason why we have decided to take part in the by-elections is to get into 
the National Assembly. For the last 20 years or more, we have been engaging in what one might call extra parliamentary politics because we have not been, uh, there has not been a parliament in which to operate. And we decided to boycott the 2010 uh, elections because election laws then were not acceptable to us. Since the laws have been changed, we decided to contest elections. And by doing so, we will be expanding our activities into parliament and we shall try to bring about a central legislation, legislation that will help to establish rule of law, to, to bring about uh, economic success, and many other things. But to begin with, I think we would like to achieve rule of law and peace, and we would like to amend the Constitution. We, uh, we wish you the best of luck from our end over here. Thank you. Minglala and my name is Tata Ton and I'm from Montreal, Uni uh, Montreal uh, Concordia University. I have uh, two specific questions. One is that you, um, every um, political institutions like uh, government or political parties, they have uh, advisors. And I understand that many of your party members, they're giving you advices, but do you have uh, any special advisors for your policy like uh, you are political campaigns and everything. And another question is, you will have a maximum 48 seats when you go to elections. So you have a very little chance to reform. I'm not pessimistic, but it, it needs time and it also needs the collaboration of the recent government. So what is your reaction and what is your preparation for that? Thank you. With the regard to the first question, the NLD has always had separate uh, committees. For example, a committee on health, a committee on education, a committee on labor, and so on. So we've always had committees like that. And now we have uh, campaign committees and we have a campaign manager. We work like any political party anywhere. We, although we, have, we were greatly repressed and oppressed and persecuted all these years, we have tried very hard to operate like any normal political party. Now, with regard to the second question, it is true that even if we win all 48 seats, we'll be a very small minority in the, in the National Assembly. But we do have an, uh, many allies among the ethnic nationality parties, and we are confident that we will gain more allies as we go along. And in any case, we shall be able to make the voice of the people heard, and we shall make it very clear to our country and to the rest of the world why certain, why certain legislative changes are needed. And if the government is truly in, interested in reform, I think it will be very difficult for them to ignore the voice of the people. Hello, Don. So, uh, it's um, a great honor to see you free and able to talk directly. Um, there were times I wondered if this, this would happen. Um, my question, again, is to do with the Panmong Agreement. Um, I, in my life, I've had the opportunity to know some of the elders who were involved in the original negotiations with your father and who participated in the constitutional conferences of the early 60s. And I know in their minds, they never felt they were threatening the future of the Union. Um, the military took that differently. And I think if they were here with us, they'd be gratified to hear your words. But I wonder um, if the military is able to achieve the same understanding you have, um, if you see any hope that they are, are rethinking their position on the rights of states, um, and if they can are able to understand the basic concepts given the level of propagandization. The military is made up of human beings, and I think all human beings are capable of understanding. The only thing is that we'll have to work very hard to make sure that the views of the people and the views of the ethnic nationality peoples are heard by the right people in the military. There is a great barrier between the military and the rest of the country, and these barriers will have to be removed. And the fact that uh, we are going into the National Assembly and that there are representatives of the military there, although, of course, uh, elected representatives are not uh, exactly democratic. The fact that they are there and we are going to be there together is a step in the right direction. I think we get to talk to each other. We get to learn from one another. Okay, so we have one more question then for you, uh, very quickly. Okay, um, my name is Mbonisi Zikali. Uh, I'm a master's in journalism student. Uh, I come from Zimbabwe. 
And uh, in the coming month, it will be the International uh, Women's Day, and it's been a century and one year uh, since the first one. And I just wanted you to give us an idea of, um, of what women uh, face in Burma and uh, what, uh, what your party is doing uh, in forecasting uh, the future for Burmese women. Now, a lot of people say that uh, Burmese women are very independent and that compared to be, uh, other uh, countries in the region, the, the position of Burmese women is very good. But there are still, there, there is still a lot of gender discrimination, although it's not so obvious. I will just give you one very small fact. In the National Assembly now, there are only 15 women. There are over 600 altogether. Only 15 women, and I think that that's shocking. Now we are we are fielding 13 women in in the coming by-elections, which is not really to my satisfaction. Uh, 13 out of 48 to me is too few. But when you consider that we are fielding as many can almost as many candidates as there already are within the present National Assembly, uh, we are doing a lot towards making the role of women more effective in government, and we will continue to do so. I think the future of women in this country is bright because the Burmese women are very, um, well, are, are very active and, and, and very courageous and uh, very outspoken. I think uh, Burmese women in many, many ways are the hope of our country. Sometimes I think they're the only men in the country. <laughs> Thank you. Dasu Chi, uh, I know your time is out. There's more people that would like to ask questions. I just, on my behalf, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this opportunity for the first time to address Canadians like this, to talk to students. Um, it's a great stride forward. We've been looking forward to this day. Uh, to hear your voice and to hear your perspective is incredibly important. And we hope we can do this again soon. And I would li like to ask you, I know the President of Carleton would like to thank you personally, but before she does, would you like to make a closing statement to the students and to our country as you, as you talk? Well, the closing statement will have to be one of thanks. I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to get in touch with your students. It matters a great deal for, to me. I want to get in touch with young people everywhere because I want to be a bridge between our young people and your young people and young people in other parts of the world. The young people of Burma have been cut off from the rest of the world for so long and we need to repair all the damage that has been done by these years of isolation. So let me apologize for the fact that I have not been able to answer all your questions. It's because of my very tight election uh, campaign schedule that I still have uh, some work to finish before I go off to the Shan State tomorrow. And uh, I want to say to you, please do get in with me, although I have not been able to answer some of uh, those who are waiting to ask questions, please do get in, get in touch with me uh, via email. You'd be surprised the NLD has email now. That's progress. Uh, three years ago, we didn't even have a telephone because they cut it off. So I hope to hear from you. I hope to keep in touch with you. And I hope that in future, not just Canada, but the whole world will be able to join us in making sure that the future of our young people is much better than what the past has been. Thank you very much. I think you're getting a standing ovation here. Dr. Key, when I was in Burma, I heard a story of a um, many, many years ago, perhaps in the Middle Ages, um, and it, an invasion, and in order to save the temple from the invasion, the people brought the bell and the, uh, the precious statues from the uh, temple and dropped them in the river. Uh, so the bell was there, but it was a symbol. And in a sense, your voice is a voice that has never been silenced, despite the fact that you were imprisoned. 
And we appreciate hearing that crystal clear bell. And we think it's a really important part of our education to hear people like you and to be able to appreciate your leadership. I thank all the students for their wonderful questions. I thank the staff for organizing this. I thank the Friends of Burma. And I thank especially Evan, our wonderful host. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, President. And, and Dr. Suchi, I just, I'd like to uh, invite up Tin Mong Tu, who is the Executive Director of the Canadian Friends of Burma, who's done extraordinary work, just to say, it's just to say a, a word. Of course, I know he wants to, and he very much deserves to. Come on. มีลาบาตุสุอ่าอคุลุมโยมาเลติจาเลยอ่ะบ่เนาะดีอ่าอะชิญยูบี้တော့โอ้อคุลุมโยลุบี้เลยเนาะจนเนี่ยอาจารย